So welcome everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. It's Sarah and Inez here um, live from the south of France at the Place of Grace and we're here to fill you in a little bit more about what is Equisoma Horse Human Trauma Recovery. We thought we'd start off by having a short video that answers a number of the commonly asked questions that people come to us about to understand a little bit more about what this is. So we thought we would go through um, a number of uh, frequent questions and take a little bit of time to really walk through what is Equisoma Horse Human Trauma Recovery and what makes this different um, from other things that are out there. And sometimes it's easiest to start with uh, saying what it is not. This is true. So what would you say, Sarah? What is yeah. Uh, what is it not? So Equisoma is not, and this is often a common um, misunderstanding, but we understand it. Um, Equisoma is not uh, an approach for equine assisted psychotherapy and learning. And that may, su may surprise a number of you because we certainly have a number of students in the training program who are obviously equine assisted psychotherapy and learning professionals. Um, so while we do have a number of people who are learning about Equisoma, horse human trauma recovery, and applying it in that context, it's not exclusively that. Um, so I like to think of it more as a paradigm. So a paradigm being a broader um, way of thinking and being um, with frameworks and concepts and principles and methods of practice that can inform a wide range of equine based professionals. So certainly equine assisted psychotherapy and learning professionals are among our students, but we also have veterinarians, equine body workers, equine behavior consultants, um, horsemanship trainers or instructors, riding instructors, um, animal communicators, and so on, all of whom have a very different scope of practice within which they are interacting with people and with equines of various kinds. Um, and this knowledge can inform each of these areas of practice. Too. Certainly. So that's what it's not. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we can talk a little bit about what it actually is. Um, and so um, horse human trauma recovery is about understanding how trauma manifests in equines and in humans in various contexts and how, if left unresolved, can negatively impact uh, behavior, relationships, performance, learning, um, uh, as well as the capacity to handle, <clears throat> excuse me, to handle various different life situations and transitions. Mm, that's right. <clears throat> yeah. And that's really what is interesting about it is that it touches um, on any type of situation that we might encounter either mm -hmm. with ourselves or with the horse because as we uh, progress in the understanding of trauma, we realize that it's everywhere mm -hmm. and that it shows up in so many different contexts and looking at it differently and recognizing it can really change our way um, of being with each other, of being with our horses, and also the way of how we are with ourselves. Yeah, lovely. Mm. <clears throat> and one of the things that um, we really emphasize in this work is understanding um, the conditions that can lead to trauma responses becoming sort of problematic in the horse-human intersection. Um, and so that can be both um, the external conditions, which can be environmental, but also relational, what is happening in the interrelationships, as well as the environmental conditions that can be creating and or exacerbating trauma responses in both species. Um, and also what's happening on the inside in terms of leftover trauma imprints or trauma patterning in the body, in the nervous system, that can also intersect with the environment environment and relationships uh, and create these problematic situations um, that many people are left scratching their heads not knowing quite how to handle mm -hmm. um, and and that's sort of what we're looking at there yeah, yeah. And together we will become curious in uh, observing what is happening what are the conditions like and how do they impact mm -hmm. and um, what's happening on the inside as something on the outside shows up and vice versa mm -hmm. so there will be some experiences that will allow us to explore these uh, things with ourselves, um, with the group, with the equines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if left unresolved, of course, you know, many people, first of all, 
think of trauma more broadly. You know, they think, well, you know, I don't have trauma, this doesn't apply to me. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's often a common thing too. Like, why is this relevant? Often, we take a much more nuanced definition of trauma um, in how we've learned to adapt to basic, you know, basic life situations as a result of our previous experiences. And so a trauma response is not just a trigger or a flashback. A trauma response can be anxiety can be shut down, can be learned helplessness, can be aggression, can be uh, an addictive behavior or a compulsive behavior pattern. Um, it can be um, a, a behavior that is more dissociated, difficulty being present, difficulty following instructions or being even willing to follow instructions. Yeah. Um, and so trauma responses show up in a lot of different ways uh, and they can intersect with things like personality or temperament as well as our genetics and the environmental conditions, both sort of physical and relational, to create difficult situations that sometimes we're hard pressed to know how to quite how to quite address. Yeah. Uh, and so many humans and equines end up getting written off as being willful or overly dominant or overly problematic or too dysregulated or too intense or too shut down um, or as as we sometimes see within the human addictions field, you know, an addict has a vice, you know, or in equines, stable vices. Um, but these usually represent um, either current or past adverse conditions that have impacted the physiology or the body's way of coping with stress. Um, and so part of what we're wanting to do is help us develop that trauma lens um, with a broader sort of sense as to how our different life adversities can impact our way of being and coping in the world. And then how do we help restore and resolve that so that the nervous system has more capacity mm. um, to get through things with much more ease and resilience. Um, and that's, that's the, main, the main feature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of misunderstanding and judgment uh, towards these behaviors if we don't go further to really understand where they are actually coming from. Mm -hmm. Because what trauma can do to us, it can really distort who we really are. And uh, recognizing that uh, can help us to take away the judgment and can take, us, take away also the, the, the fixated view that we can have of ourselves and of others and open up to see um, a wider perspective mm -hmm. and maybe reevaluate and um, slow down, observe and become curious. Yeah. And that curiosity piece is so important, especially in the equine industries. There are so many camps, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. in the equine world, mm -hmm. there's all these, well, I do clicker training and you do natural horsemanship and you're doing it wrong. No, you're doing it wrong and you're abusing and you're abusing and, and, and there's all this, these slings and arrows get thrown back and forth between the camps. And we see that within any industry. Whenever there's the presence of polarization like that, where I'm right and you're wrong, that in and of itself is a fragmentation that can be indicative of a trauma pattern. You know, that if it's that polarized or that black and white and there isn't any shades of gray, then that already is an area to be curious yeah. about. Yeah. You know, and so we're looking at all of that. You know, we have people who come from the clicker training you know, sort of strong behavioral perspective who come to the training. We have people who are more on the natural or relational horsemanship end of the, of the spectrum, and we have everyone in between. And we're looking at how, does, how do we bring an understanding of trauma and attachment and the nervous system into all of this so that all of it can be done with this sensitivity in mind. Yeah, you know? and that brings us to a place where we're becoming much more flexible to decide um, what method we decide to apply in a given situation depending on the conditions and the different um, elements that make up the context. Mm -hmm. So um, what really happens is that our spectrum widens in terms of um, the, the tools um, and the means we have to um, go about something. Yeah, and this makes it a lot more organic and a lot more customized to the situation at hand as opposed to this being a set of instructions, oh, you apply this method like this and here are all the steps. Um, it's more about a series of principles and practices and ways of being uh, and how to attune to what is actually happening in the nervous system, in the body, to recognize the patterning and help restore um, functioning in the nervous system in a way that is um, enhancing of, of 
an organism or a being's capacity in the world as opposed to, well, now I'm going to do X, Y, and Z to make this be different in some way. Mm -hmm. um, so this is more about, again, this is why we call it a paradigm shift as opposed to a specific method. Certainly what we teach can be applied within different methods. So for instance, one influence that we have is the humane hierarchy. Um, so for those of you who are in the field of equine behaviorism will understand the humane hierarchy as being a series of steps that we look at in sequence to address problematic behaviors in equines uh, in a systematic fashion and starting with understanding what is going on in terms of health to then looking at the antecedents or the conditions to then looking at different forms of reinforcement to, to get to uh, addressing the problems. And we look at the humane hierarchy, love it, and also go beyond behaviorism because there are some adaptations that can be done to the humane hierarchy based on an understanding of trauma, on an understanding of the nervous system, on an understanding of um, some of the neuroscience that's coming out of the mammalian science models, um, such as somatic experiencing and polyvagal theory, that can be very helpful for adapting what is taught in the humane hierarchy. So that's one way that we look at this. Mm. So another uh, source of knowledge that we use is somatic experiencing. So somatic experiencing is a, uh, a method of trauma resolution. Um, it's not considered a therapy per se, although it can be used in the context of therapy, but it's viewed to be uh, a trauma re resolution method that can be used by a number of different scopes of practice. It was based in an understanding of how animals, mammals specifically, recover from trauma um, and was applied to humans as a trauma therapy um, method and we're taking that and bringing it back around not just to the humans but also the animals involved in the situation so how can this knowledge that starts with animals be brought back around to the animals in question and we thought that that was a very interesting discrepancy and we we thought hey let's let's bring it back <laughs> um, and, and in a weird way that's a very colonialist perspective take something from a, a group of people for instance or a population apply it over here and then not use it back with where it originated from. Um, and so we also have a, a social justice perspective in our work where being trauma informed means also looking at how trauma affects different populations, human and equine, um, unequally or mm. um, in, un inequitably. And how do we go about recognizing privilege and power and control dynamics and social injustice, both within humans, but also within um, interspecies interactions and how all of these layers can impact trauma response. Um, and so us bringing somatic experiencing back around to the animals um, is, in, is our version of that, mm. you know. Yeah. Um, polyvagal theory is another one yeah. that we use. Yeah. Uh, polyvagal theory is from Dr. Stephen Porges, um, and uh, his most recent book that came out in 2021, Polyvagal Safety, is a really fascinating read. Um, some of you may already be aware of some of the controversies around polyvagal theory, and if you, this is beyond the scope of our video today, but if that's one of the things that has turned you off of Equisoma, um, take a look at polyvagal safety. The second chapter of the book is a complete write-up of exactly what the misconceptions are of polyvagal theory, and Dr. Porges does a wonderful job, way better than I can do, in explaining where some of these misperceptions have evolved from and how to make sense of them to understand the controversy around it. We really like polyvagal theory because we find it's a very elegant way of understanding the nervous system and it's far more nuanced than anything else that's out there currently today. Mm. Um, and it's a predictable model and it's when you understand it, it's really fascinating to see it in practice and there is a fair amount of evidence in support of it. Yeah. Um, so um, we use polyvagal theory as well. It is but one of many other frameworks that we include in Equisoma. Attachment theory is another. Mm -hmm. um, we look a fair amount at attachment theory and understanding in mammals how relationships form, how safe and secure relationships form, how insecure relationships form, and how do we go about supporting um, that kind of um, safety and um, repair of ruptures in relationships, both human to human, but also human to equine. Um, we look at ethology. 
Ethology is another area of practice that we bring in. Ethology is the study of um, organisms, mammals, in their optimal circumstances. And as we said earlier, um, one of the issues is, of course, the conditions, the captivity conditions, both internal, well, <laughs> the impact of external, environmental and relational captivity conditions on the internal state. Um, and ethology looks at, well, what would the optimal conditions look like? And what does op op uh, um, optimal functioning look like when those optimal conditions are there? And how do we go about addressing it from that perspective? Yeah. There are many myths about horses and equines in general um, that come out of a belief that how they are in captivity is how they truly are. And that would not necessarily be true. <laughs> we have one of Inez's friends here at the Place of Grace joining us. I don't know if he's in yeah. the video, but no, Jeannot just walked that. up. Yeah. Jeannot is a standard donkey. donkey. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and maybe that's a good po uh, moment to just uh, say something briefly about the equines involved in this program. Yeah. Uh, what is really important to us is that they have a choice and that we um, become curious um, about understanding of how they consent mm -hmm. or not mm -hmm. uh, to some of the things that we um, experience with them in our interactions. So, um, like a lot of the activities we suggest are um, exploratory and um, invite this, um, this curious spirit of um, see what happens um, for the human in the human nervous system, mm -hmm. but also we learn to read the nervous system of the equines. Mm -hmm. And we're curious about what signals they are sending us. Um, also looking at um, different uh, postures and involuntary responses um, at their end that can give us some information about this. Yeah, certainly. And so we also draw on um, understanding equine behavior in these various contexts. What does that look like? And so this is true of the animals here at your farm as well, where they are living with these conditions in place that we're, we're practicing. And so one of the things that people often find when they come here to the Place of Grace as one of our training sites is just, they remark at just how interesting and different the animals are. Um, yeah. because they've been exposed to these conditions yeah. and this way of relating to them. And one of the pieces of feedback we get often is, wow, you know, the animals here are so attuned and they're so connected to nuance and they respond to nuance. And that's because we're responding and attuning to nuance as well. Yeah. Um, and a big piece of this work is about the attunement and how does the attunement to the nervous system and to the relational process create what we might call a renegotiation as opposed to a reenactment. Yeah. And so a lot of the work of Equisoma is shifting out of reenactments, which is where we are repeating a trauma pattern in a different circumstance, a trauma pattern that may have existed from a previous time, whether for the animal or for the human, but we're, we're instead of repeating that trauma pattern or reenacting it as if it's a theater play in a different scene or a different setting, we're actually renegotiating. We're getting to notice the the pattern and have a different experience or a different response. Mm. Uh, and part of that involves what I like to call the, the whole place around being seen and heard, feeling felt and getting gotten, oh, yeah. which is hard yeah. to translate, but yeah. um, is a, a funny turn of phrase in English about this idea of feeling felt. I recognize when you feel me. Mm -hmm. I can feel when you feel me and that would be attunement. Mm -hmm. And animals pick up on that. Mm -hmm. Animals can pick up on when we notice something in them and then we show responsiveness to the attunement. And, and there's almost like a moment of, oh, you saw that, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And then when the animals are seen or by us or feel felt by us or feel like, you know, like I, you get me, mm -hmm. right? The animal feels like we get them or we understand them. Something starts to shift in the relationship around the felt sense of safety with one another. And ultimately, as Stephen Porges says, the felt sense of safety is the treatment. Yeah. This is different from safety rules, but it's the felt sense of safety, not mind head instructions, do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. But do I feel safe with you? Do you feel safe with me? And what's different as we renegotiate that? And as we apply these trauma-informed principles, we start asking the question um, much rather, um, what happened to you uh, that this behavior is showing up in this moment, rather than saying, what's wrong with you that mm -hmm. you do it this way? Mm -hmm. 
and um, that's what invites and opens up uh, the space of um, entering a dialogue that is based on um, mutual recognition mm -hmm. and what you were saying about attunement yeah. and about being seen feeling felt and and getting gotten because at the end of the day that's um, a very basic um, desire and need that we all have as mammals mm -hmm. Yeah, is to feel safe. Yeah. I want to feel safe with you. Yeah. My natural way of being is to get along, yeah. right? Our natural way of being is to feel, um, as my colleague LaSalle likes to say, LaSalle Bartlett, she, she says it's in our nature to get along, yeah. right? Yeah. It's our nature. Our, if you look at equines in the wild, Lucy Reese's work is really interesting, looking at affiliative behaviors in horse herds. And affiliative behaviors outnumber conflict behaviors 20 to 1. Um, in the wild or in feral situations and that tells us something very interesting about what the true nature is mm -hmm. and when the conditions are optimal what actually is possible and and if we start looking at humans or equines as and, as, and associating or equating their problem behaviors with well with that's just who they are when in reality that's who they are in captivity then it tells us something about the captivity conditions and how can we go about renegotiating that. Yeah. You know? And it also tells us that um, very often when there is conflict behavior or, um, or fight behavior, mm -hmm. we might want to cut this out, I just had a lapse there. Well, we can keep it. I, mean, yeah. I, think that's, I think that's important to say though because there's going to be um, moments where that behavior shows up. Yeah, so what I wanted mm -hmm. to say is that what, what this really teaches us is that every time conflict shows up, we can also be curious about what the trauma is behind it. Mm -hmm. And the more trauma, there's usually also more conflict. Yeah. And also the conditions. And if so the, those two together so, mm -hmm. um, are really important to, uh, to consider uh, when we are um, looking at a situation and making a judgment or not. Well, and one thing too with that um, is the idea is, you know, if you don't like the word trauma, because the word trauma seems very heavy for you, conflict behaviors can show up even in the absence of trauma. It can represent a, a sense of scarcity. I'm having conflict behavior because I'm guarding the resources of the food because there's not enough food. And, you know, is that trauma? Well, it, but it's a captivity condition. There's something that's creating a stressor and then we're noticing a nervous system response. And so, so whatever the reason for the fight response, we want to start to get, like you said, curious mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. Just like we want to get curious about behaviors like compliance, um, overly appeasing or overly agreeable people and horses mm -hmm. <laughs> and equines. Um, there's interesting research that shows that equines that are very agreeable, often have higher stress hormones in their bodies. Um, so the agreeableness may be a coping strategy. Not all agreeable nervous systems are obviously carrying a lot of stress, but certainly we want to be curious about these things from this lens. You know, is, is there actual connection and consent or is what I'm seeing a compensation or an, ad an adaptation, a management strategy to cope with relationships because I've learned that I'm not safe in relationships, mm -hmm. right? How do we recognize dissociation, calming signals? Um, there's lots of different behaviors that we can pick up on. Incomplete flight responses, incomplete orienting responses. There's so many different patterns that can show up in the nervous system that can manifest as behavior problems, mm -hmm. but they're not really. They're just telling us a story about the nervous system and what's left. And as we become more curious about these things in us, in us humans, we also start seeing them much more in our animals. Mm -hmm. And we see how they play out um, um, in the dynamics of the relationship. Yeah, yeah, certainly. And then we also uh, get to touch on the topic of boundaries, um, which is something that shows up um, uh, with trauma. Mm -hmm. Most of the time when there is trauma, there's also a boundary rupture. Mm -hmm. And um, we're going to be exploring these uh, boundaries with each other and uh, the equines to see what does it take to repair as we start to see and um, notice that something in, in, our, in our feeling of personal space mm -hmm. has been disrupted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these boundary and relational ruptures can be repaired and renegotiated. And so that's part of the work that we're doing here is how do we recognize that? Mm -hmm. So what we like to think of equisoma as is 
a paradigm and a foundation upon which you can build horse training or behavior shaping or equine assisted psychotherapy and learning for your human clients and so on or your bodywork practice it, it becomes a way of, of being and a way of seeing um, the the horse human patterning and relationship and a way of proceeding differently um, so we're really excited about the program and we really invite you, if you're curious, to learn more. Yeah. Um, check out our website and uh, feel free to reach out to us if, we're, if you have any other questions. And yeah. we look forward to seeing you at a future training. Yeah, very much so.